Well, amen. Thank God for that day when he changed us. Amen. And what a tremendous, uh, I believe, day that we've had already in God's house. And I'm excited to be here again tonight and glad that you came back. Uh, and I hope that the Lord will be uh, blessing your heart and encouraging you. That's the main thing we want to do. Uh, there's a lot of uh, discouragement out there. And uh, we've turned the corner and flipped over the calendar onto 2022. And I hope that you'll uh, understand tonight a little bit about where we're headed and where we're moving towards uh, in this uh Next, or in this new year that we're in now, I guess, uh, and we're just excited about what God's going to do with our church, and I'm so excited about all the opportunities. We are sitting on a gold mine as a church of opportunity. We are in a place where our town is about to explode with growth. It really is already exploding. And there are thousands and thousands of people that are coming into our area. And uh, we just need to get doing exactly what God would have us to do and let God give the increase. Amen. And so we're so glad about that you're here tonight. And I hope that this message will be an encouragement to you. Uh, when I was a little kid, I was up in, uh, my dad was pastoring and starting a church in Goshen, Indiana. And I remember we had this big, gigantic, I call it a haunted house. Uh, it was this two-story house. And it was... Uh, not the nicest house in the neighborhood. It was kind of, uh, you know, it was falling down, but it looked like it might be falling down. And um, it had that uh, that big arched window up in the front, in the front on the uh, top floor, uh, just like a couple horror movies, you know, that you can think about about houses that got possessed. And so I had wonderful nightmares. I mean, dreams when I was a kid living in that house. And I, I just remember that we lived in this little bitty area where there was a bunch of kids and uh, we played football all the time. And so we would go over to my friend's house and he would come over to our little yard or we'd go over to these other people's yard in between. And I don't think they really cared for us playing football in their yard, but they didn't say anything about it. And so we would meet in different places and different times and we would see something on TV on Sunday. We were watching uh, the Cowboys, of course, uh, and we would watch other football teams and we'd try to replicate that and we would be out there playing football. I mean, we're just having the greatest time. I'm about seven, eight, nine years old uh, and we're we're just playing, and, and it wasn't even a real game. We were just kind of setting up these plays, and, and I would say, hey, you jump up, and then he'll throw the ball to you, and then I'll come, and I'll try to tackle you, and then you do this to me, and I, it was it, half the time it wasn't even a football game. But what we wanted to do more than anything else was get dirty. You remember back then when you were like seven or eight, nine years old, and you played football, all you cared about was getting your clothes and your jersey all dirty. Because that means that you had really played football. You can't come back with a jersey that has no stains on it. And I remember a lot of times it didn't happen that I got dirty. There was no dirt on me, no stains, no nothing. And I remember on the way home, I thought to myself, I can't go home without my jersey dirty. They'll think I didn't play football. And so I would go find a mud puddle on the way home. And run my jersey through it and jump in it and rub all the mud all over me. And my mom is now realizing what was going on all the time with the laundry. But you couldn't go home from a football game without being dirty. Well, I don't remember what year it was. But one of those years, for Christmas, I got a real official Rawlings Cowboy, Dallas Cowboy jersey, number 12. Roger Stallback, baby, way back in the day when the Dallas Cowboys were America's team and everybody, even that didn't, wasn't from Texas, loved the Cowboys. And I mean, when I got that jersey and put that real Rawlings official football jersey with number 12, Roger Stallback on the back of that thing, I mean, I was proud as a peacock. I went out that next day and showed all my friends, look at my football, it's a real football jersey. And you know, after that, I never one time jumped in a mud puddle. Not one time did I get down in the mud. Matter of fact, I didn't even set up any plays, and I didn't even play when it was muddy. And if it was a little dirty, I would make sure that we played and postponed the game till later. Because I did not want to get that brand new white and blue and just silver lining Cowboys jersey. I didn't want to get it dirty. I'm going to preach a message tonight, 
entitled, The One with the Dirtiest Towel Wins. The one with the dirtiest towel wins. What happens in our life is as we go through our Christian life and this Christian existence and this journey that we're on, at first, we're wanting to get real dirty for the Lord and serve the Lord any which way possible. Just put me in the game, coach. I just want to be a part of it. I don't care what happens. I don't care what I got to do. If I got to take out the trash for the Lord, then praise God, I'll take out the trash. And somewhere down the road, we get a brand new Cowboys jersey. And we decide that we don't want to get dirty anymore. Would you look with me in the Gospel of John, chapter 13? The Gospel of John, chapter 13. I'm going to read the whole entire passage all the way down to verse 20. So bear with me a little bit. Uh, you need to see the whole entire text here so that you can understand what's going on. And I know that you know about this event in the life of Christ. And it's not going to be a surprise to you, anything that we're going to give you tonight. But I just want to make sure that we understand, starting out this year... Number one, that you understand where we're going as a church. And number two, that you understand sometimes we get prideful. And sometimes we get arrogant. And we get lifted up by the position that God's put us in. Or we get lifted up by the success that we've had in the ministry or serving God before. Or we just plain get tired of serving and I want you to understand that we need to get back in 2022, we need to make a serious commitment to the Lord that we're going to get our towel dirty again. Look at verse 1 of chapter 13. The Bible says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Aren't you glad that he loved them unto the end? I'll tell you right now, that'll preach right there, guys. If you're looking for a message, those of you that are, are preachers in preaching in chapel or wherever you may be preaching, that, that'll preach right there. He didn't just love them all the way almost to the end of his time here on earth. Ever since, and ever since he got here all the way to the ascension and he was up in the clouds, he loved the disciples. And he'll love us to the end too. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son to betray him Jesus knowing that the father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God he riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself now let me stop right here because I want you to understand what's going on the Bible gives us a very clear definition of what's going on in the mind of Christ not only has the devil entered into Judas Iscariot, and in another text you can find that conversation between Jesus and Judas Iscariot, where it goes something a little bit like this. Judas, what you're going to do, go ahead and do it. Everybody else at the table thought that he was talking about going and doing something for the poor, or doing some kind of charity work, or some kind of something that Jesus wanted him to do. But Jesus knew exactly what he was telling Judas, and Judas knew what he was saying. Judas knew that he was going to betray the Lord for 30 pieces of silver. It all already had been arranged. It had already been programmed. It had already been adjusted. Everything was ready to go. And so Jesus said, Judas, what you're going to do, go do it. It's time. And when Jesus set Judas on the path and told him to go ahead and do what was in his heart that the devil had put there, God didn't put that in his heart. God didn't make him do that. But God knew what was going to happen when he did. And as soon as he left that upper room and took off to do on his evil uh, betrayal mission that he was on, Jesus knew that his time was come. The time to begin the agony, the time to begin uh, the crucifixion, the time to begin the time of prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, the time to walk through Jerusalem, the time to be tried, all of what was going to be the whole package, if you will of salvation's plan was beginning. The time clock had started. But you know what's interesting to me about that? Is if it were you and I, that's when we would have sat back in some kind of easy chair and said, look, man, I got, I got 30 minutes till this thing starts. I'm going to rest for a minute. I'm going I'm to sit back here. I'm not going to do anything. Isn't that the way we would have reacted? 
If you know that you're about to suffer for the next two days and that all of eternity and everything is hanging in the balance, you're going to become sin for all mankind. You're going to die on the cross. I tell you right now, that's not the time I'm going to make the biggest illustration of service in my entire ministry. But Jesus decided right at that moment that he would rise from the supper table, from everybody reclined and all the way that they were in, a, in an L shape, the way they used to eat back then. He rises from supper and laid aside his garments, that's the outer garments, he took those off, and he would probably have wrapped up a little bit of the robe into uh, uh, girding himself, as the Bible calls it, so that he could move and, and he could bend over in, in a good fashion. And so he laid aside his outer garments, he took a towel, from one of the servants, I'm assuming, and girded himself. After that, he poureth water into a basin and began to wash to the disciples' feet. Now, can't you just see the disciples? They, they're in the middle uh, of the preparatory and the beginning parts of the, the supper, of the Passover, and they've done some of the Passover. We don't know exactly where this is located uh, chronologically, but they have began to have parts of the supper, and they might have even passed the bitter herbs. They might have done uh, some of the prayers. They might have done some of, of those different things. But some elements of the dinner have been done, and now Jesus gets up and girds himself, gets a towel from one of the servants, and he stands up and he goes over to the water basin. They would have a place for this uh, where the servants would wash everybody's feet when they came into the, the room. And, and so he goes over to the water basin and he grabs the water pitcher and he begins to pour some water into a, 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 probably a tub or a trough of some kind. And can't you just imagine the disciples are all going, man, what's he doing? Boy, this is going to be good. Watch this. I mean, you know, they've, they've been seen three and a half years worth of miracles. They've seen all kinds of amazing things. And they have no idea what Jesus is about to do. And so he gets up and he pours that water into the basin or whatever uh, receptacle that he was going to use. And he takes that towel and he moves that little basin or little uh, 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 whatever container it was. And he moves it over there and he starts to wash the disciples' feet in order as he goes around the table. Now, they're reclining on their side. Uh, that's the, to the tables were low, and they had a lot of pillows around. And they didn't sit in chairs like we normally do now. And so their feet were extended out into the outside part, uh, away from the table. And their feet would be ready, readily accessible. I don't know who he started with. But I do know that he began to wash the first disciples' feet. And everybody had to be going, what in the world? We know that Peter was shocked. Because of his response. Can you imagine? Now listen, I don't, I don't even want to go. I've got a pastor friend that I, I'm still appalled at. He goes to get, and I won't tell you who it is, but he goes to those places and gets a pedicure. And, and I still, I, I'm shocked, even when I say that right now, thinking about him doing that. And listen, I don't want anybody messing with my feet. I don't want to mess with anybody else's feet. Can you imagine laying there, reclining up against that table, having shared a, a meal and all the things that have happened, and your feet are sticking out there, and now the Lord himself comes over there and kneels down and takes the towel and dips it in the water and washes your feet. Unbelievable. Then cometh he to Simon Peter. And Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? He says, Lord, what are you thinking? What are you about to do? Are you coming over here? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. It wasn't very long into this evening that Peter figured out what was going on. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. You go, Peter. I love the way he does things. Here is the Lord. Okay? God Almighty. The God-man. 
creator of the universe. Peter knows exactly who he is. He's seen all the miracles. He's walked closely with the Lord three and a half years. He knows who he is. And he says, hey, buddy, you're not washing my feet. Peter, don't you realize that God could yank your feet off of your body and wash them if he wants to? The Lord is going to do whatever he wants to do. What was he really saying here? He's not saying, Lord, you won't. Lord, you can't. He's saying, Lord, how could I let you wash my feet? Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Oh, well, if you're going to put it that way, Lord, wash my whole body. Here we go. I need a whole bath. Go ahead. That's basically what he said. Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus saith unto him, He that is washed, needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. Now, there's a whole bunch of symbolism going on in here that does not fit into the message tonight. What is Jesus saying? If you're cleansed from your sins, you don't need me to wash your whole body, Peter. All I got to do is wash your feet because they've been in the dirty, filthy world. And see, the Lord doesn't need to wash our soul. and He doesn't need to wash our whole being if you're a child of God. You've been saved. You've been washed by the blood of the Lamb. You don't need to have your whole being or your whole soul washed. You just need to have your feet washed. Because you've been walking around in this dirty world the way we spoke about it this morning. Jesus saith unto him, or to him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is cleansed, clean every whit. And ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore said he, ye are not all clean. Judas Iscariot had just left the room. He knew who was clean and who wasn't clean. You see, I... I just have no place for these commentators and theologians that act like these things occurred to Jesus. Do you understand that Jesus didn't get up from the table after everything was over and go, Oh, wait a minute. Did you guys hear? Judas went out and betrayed me. Can you believe that? No, that's not the way it happened. Jesus didn't get into the temple when he was 12 years old and go, Whoa, I think I'm the son of God. Can you believe it? No, that's not the way it worked. He's all God and he's all man all the time. Jesus knew what Judas was doing. He knew where he was at right in that very specific minute. He knew exactly what he was talking to and who he was talking to and how much money he was getting. And when they would be there with the swords and the staves and all the army and the Roman leaders, he knew it all. He's the Lord. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? Now here's the, here's the crux of this whole thing tonight. Jesus gets done washing all the disciples' feet, minus Judas Iscariot. He washes all of their feet, and every one of them's got two of them. Yeah. 22 feet. That's a lot of foot washing. It would have took a while. You know, and who knows? Maybe Peter was like I was when I was a kid, and he likes to run through the mud puddles. He washes all of their feet, and then he sits back, he puts his towel down, and he, he gets back with his outer garments and gets set down where he was again, and he looks at all the disciples, and he says, do you know what I've done? Do you understand what I've just done? And I'm sure all of them looked around going, no, we don't have any idea what that was about. They may not have said anything, but that's what they were thinking. He says in verse 13, ye call me master and Lord, and ye say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. 
for I, now watch here, this is where we want to make sure that you understand. Jesus didn't say that we need to wash each other's feet for the next 2,000 years. Okay, there's some churches that still do this because they didn't read the next verse. Verse 15 says, for I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. He's not talking about the aspect of foot washing. He's talking about the humility that it takes to be the Lord of glory and to get down and wash other people's feet. You see, Jesus is our perfect, absolutely perfect example of how to be a Christian. And so he is in the highest position that any being could ever be in. He's God. And yet he humbled himself to serve other people. Verily, verily, Jesus says, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. Neither he that is sent greater than than he that sent him. Now, wait a minute. What is that? What he's saying here is that the servant's not greater than his Lord, and you're not better than the one that sent you. Jesus said, so send I you into the world the way that he came and to do what he did. So Jesus is the Lord. He's the one that sent you into the world. And guess what? You're not greater than Jesus. Anybody have a problem with that tonight? I think we all understand that, don't we? Not any of us anywhere close in the same atmosphere as Jesus. So, if the servant is not greater than he that sent him, and the servant is to be like his master, our master humbled himself to serve other people. So what does that mean we ought to do? Serve other people. Serve the Lord. Do whatever is required of us. Do whatever is necessary to propagate the gospel, to get people saved, to get people to grow in the Lord. Whatever is absolutely necessary, uh, we should be willing, and not only willing, but excited about serving the Lord in that way. I'm not saying this so that I can say, brag about myself or anything like that because this has nothing to do with it. I just want to give you an example. There's been a couple times, well, more than a couple actually, where I have seen something that was going on. Maybe whatever happened, there, the person that was cleaning or whatever was going on didn't get to it or we didn't have time or whatever the situation was. And I went to get the vacuum cleaner and I vacuumed up here in the front quite a few times and I vacuumed in the offices and in the halls. And, and places like that. And I've had people on staff and people come up and say, well, Preacher, you're the preacher. You shouldn't do that. Let me do that. And I understand the attitude behind that. I really do. And I wasn't upset about it. But listen, it doesn't matter if I'm the pastor. Are you with me? I should be willing to vacuum the whole entire church if necessary. I should be willing to clean the toilets, which I have. I should be willing to go out and dig in the ditches and mow the yard and do all the painting and do whatever's necessary, and I have. Because there's nobody too big to serve the Lord. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 12, 24, Only fear the Lord and serve Him in truth with all your heart. With all your heart. For consider, now listen to the last part of this. Why should we serve the Lord with all of our heart? For consider how great things he has done for you. Now I don't want to discourage anybody. That's certainly not the point of the message tonight. And I don't want to make anybody mad or offend anybody tonight. But you know I think there's some of us maybe that we got a, a brand new Dallas Cowboys jersey. 
And maybe it's a position. Somebody started calling us a deacon. Somebody started calling us a Sunday school teacher. Somebody started saying we were a great member of the church. Somebody started saying this or that or the other. Or you may just made it all up in your mind. But for some reason, you've got the jersey on now and you don't want to get dirty. Well, preacher, I've been in this church for 45 years. So? Well, I I think I'm in my Christian life in a place where I don't need to do those things. Really? Every single person sitting in here that's breathing, which is all of you, as far as I can tell. Some of y'all are breathing slower and getting a lot sleepier as we go. Every single person that's in here that's a child of God ought to have a place of service in this church. You ought to have a job. What's your job? What do you do? Now, I'm looking at some people that do a lot. But I'm also looking at some people that don't. I'm looking at some people that haven't found a job. You say, well, preacher, I haven't found a job. I don't know what to do. See me after the service. Philippians chapter 2, verse 4 says, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. You see, we're going to change this banner on both sides here. This big giant banner is going to change in the next couple weeks. And it's going to start saying serve on there. 2022 is going to be the year of serve. We're going to concentrate on serving each other, serving our community, and serving our God. And we're going to develop teams and and approaches to this so that we can get organized. But let me tell you, we're going to ask you to serve. We're going to ask you to get a job. We're going to ask you to help out. We're going to ask you to to bring food to activities. We're going to ask you to take out the trash at activities. We're going to ask you to come and and set up tables. We're going to come and ask you to sit in the nursery and take care of a little baby in a little while. And we're going to ask you to maybe come and clean. And we're going to ask you to mow the yard. We're going to ask you to trim the hedges. We're going to ask you to do all kinds of things. I mean, I could stand up here all night and talk about the jobs that need to be done in this church. And our workforce, if you'd like to call it that, the number of servants, you see, that biblical word doesn't mean that you're a part-time employee. What it means is that you're a slave. The biblical word, sir, carries the connotation of being a slave And what needs to happen around here is that our workforce, if you'd like to call it that, our servants have dwindled down tremendously in the last two years. Look around. There's not nearly as many people here tonight on a Sunday night as there used to be. There's not nearly as many people on a Wednesday night as there used to be. We want to reach the children of this city and this county. Amen, Brother Colin? And we would love to start... Some type of a water program back here on Wednesday night. But guess what? We have no workers. I would love to have all of you guys come in on Thursday that are not working. That ha- that, I know there's some of you that work and you can't get out of work and we understand that. But I would love for everybody in here this, this evening to come Thursday when we have this Red River meeting. And I'd love for you to get involved and just help. So what am I going to do, preacher? I don't know. Maybe you just may carry some dishes from here to there. You may just move a table. You may just take out some trash. But listen, you're going to serve the Lord. You're going to serve other people like Jesus commanded and gave us the example to do. And you're also going to hear some amazing teaching and preaching. Oh, let me tell you, it'd be worth your while. If for nothing and for no other reason, just to rub shoulders with all these great preachers and full-time workers that are going to be here. You say, well, preacher, I don't you know, I know how this works. And if I get involved and, you know, they're going to expect me to be there all the time. And, and, you know, I know how preacher is. He's going to want me to be there on time. Well, that's, you know, we're wishing sometimes that everybody would be here on time. If you guys see and you noticed as well as I have on Sunday morning, Sunday night and Wednesday, the mad dash to get in here at 10 after. 
So apparently you don't have to be on time to serve the Lord at Grace and Bible Baptist Church. <laughs> but let me tell you, if your thought and your process in your mind is going right now, oh, man, I would like to do that, but, you know, I just think I'm, a, I'm above that. I, I'm, I've moved on past those things. I don't want to be bothered with those little things. Oh, let me tell you, for some reason you've got the prideful Dallas Cowboys jersey on and you don't want to get dirty. You see, Jesus took the towel and he washed those disciples' feet. And they had been traveling all over everywhere in the dirty, dusty streets. And you know what happens when men walk a ways? They get sweaty. You see, ladies don't get sweaty. They perspire. Okay? But let me tell you, when I was in Argentina as a missionary... We had the custom down there, and certainly I didn't invent it, and I didn't really care for it to start with. But they greet the brethren with a holy kiss. And it's a, an Italian mafia kind of thing with the men. Okay? We don't get up there and do any kind of weird thing. You grab them by the back of the neck, and you go, nah, nah, like that really hard. But you get close enough just doing those kisses in the air to get a whiff. And sometimes if you mistime it, you get some whiskers. And it's really gross. You know what I found out? When those men walked from the bus station or the train station to the church, they get sweaty. You know what I thought about in this text? The disciples' feet were sweaty and dirty and gross. And you know what you do, what happens when you take a clean white towel and put it in water and wash off somebody's dirty, sweaty, gross feet? Dirty, sweaty, gross stuff comes off on the towel. So when Jesus gets done with this scene here, guess what? He's got a dirty, sweaty, gross towel. Watch what happens. Verse 12. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, Know you what I have done to you? I don't think that he took that towel and threw it in the garbage. I think he took that towel and just wrapped it on his side or put it in there with his garments and it was just there. I think the disciples, when he was saying what he had just done and teaching them this lesson, I think the disciples were looking over on his robe and looking at that towel. And let me tell you, there's some Christians in this life that are going to get to heaven with their towel of service in pristine, super white condition. And according to what Jesus is teaching us here, I think the one with the dirtiest towel wins. I think the one that has served people every single day of their Christian life and existence, they're the ones that are going to get the rewards. Remember when Jesus said, if you just give a cup of water in my name, you're going to get a reward. If you give something to the preacher, you're going to get a preacher reward. If you give something to the prophet, you're going to get a prophet reward. Let me tell you, the one with the dirtiest towel wins. And we got Christians today that walk around with a super Christi- pristine, clean towel, and they're walking around going, Woohoo, look at me. They got it all wrong. It's not about how much work you can avoid and how you can avoid doing all those hum- humble and humility things. It's not about being some big shot, it's not about having some big title. It's about serving the Lord and being willing to do whatever it takes. To get the gospel to a dying world that's living in the darkness that we talked about this morning. So let me ask you a question. How dirty is your towel? According to what Jesus has taught us tonight, the one that dies with the dirtiest towel wins. Would you stand with your heads bowed and your eyes closed? Heavenly Father, we love you tonight, and God, we are 
so, so grateful that you give us the opportunity, and it is an opportunity, to serve. Lord, we're so grateful that in your church and in your house and in the body of Christ that we have opportunities not only to serve you, but to serve each other. And Lord, for reasons beyond me, because of the COVID-19 and everything that's happened in the last couple years, we've gotten out of the habit of serving each other. And Lord, we would sure love it if in our hearts and in our lives tonight, your Holy Spirit would put a burden in our heart to serve the Lord with all our being, with anything that's necessary, whatever you want us to do. And Lord, that you'd help us to remember and to get convicted and to get encouraged about serving each other. God, would you bring that attitude of service back to Bring that back into our lives. And God, would you help us to understand and realize that because of pride or because of arrogance or because of other things, whatever may have gotten in the way, many, many of Christians, unfortunately, have tucked up their towel and they've quit serving. Lord, would you help us to realize and understand tonight that you left us an example of being a servant. You didn't come to be ministered to, but to minister. Lord, we thank you for the example that you've left us. Would you help us and encourage us tonight to be a servant of the Lord? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.